Got you. Hey. Right. Uh, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, you, you uh, call us to uh, pray for more laborers in the vineyard. We ask that uh, you pray for uh, more priests, for more men to respond to the priesthood, and more men and women to respond to the religious life, so that uh, other, by their examples, they can show other people um, your presence in the world. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, everybody. Well, welcome. Happy Good Shepherd Sunday. Happy World Prayer of Occasions for Priests and Religious. All right. It's a long. They should just keep it short. Prayer for occasions. That's a different Sunday, I guess. All right. So Good Shepherd Sunday, World Day of Prayer for Vocations. So we got a couple sheep and some hired hands. So I want you to figure out which ones are the shepherds and which ones are the hired hands. There's three of them. It's like Waldo. There's three hired hands. So we got the shepherd, the one shepherd. Then you got the shepherd with the staff. And then you got the archbishop and behind him. Then you got the other shepherd. Then you got John Vianney, St. John Vianney, which is the patron saint of priests. And then you got some hired hands in there. All right. They're hired hands, not hiding hands. All right. This is the 58th year that they've done World Day of Prayer Vocations. How many people think it's been that long? I didn't even know about it. I thought it was like the first year. Turns out to be they've been doing it for 58 years. The purpose of World Day of Prayer for Vocations is to publicly fulfill the Lord's instruction to pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest, Matthew, Luke. As a climax to a prayer that is continually offered throughout the church, it affirms the primacy of faith and grace in all that concerns vacations to the priesthood to the consecrated life. By appreciating all vocations, the church consecrates its attention this day on vocations with ordained ministries, priesthood and diaconate, consecrated life in all its forms, male and female religious, society's apostolic life, consecrated virginity, secular institutes in their diversity of services and membership, and to the ministry of life, whatever that means. All right. So priests and religious worldwide. Now, this is like 2011, right? It's, it's already get stats too early. So there's five over 5,000 bishops worldwide, 450 United States. You guys knew that? Right. My highlighting didn't seem to come out on this. All right. Uh, priests, 413,000. And then uh, in the U.S., 42 plus. Oh, good. Deacons are going down. That's good. Um, oh, they're going up. What? Oh, my gosh. The vein of the church. All right. Religious Brothers, 55 worldwide, less than 5,000 United States. Religious Sisters, 613 worldwide, 55,000 United States. All right. Total Catholics, 1 billion to... As 70 in the United States. And that's the thing. If, if we were united as a church, we could vote for every congressman, senator, and president. And guarantee. The fact that we're divided allows evil. Because what does the Lord say? A church, you know, a house divided cannot stand. And we're divided. You know, we don't realize the power we have. All right. United States data. Dallas and Priest. In 1965, there were 35, almost 36,000 priests. Today, 26. We're down 10,000 priests in, what's that, 65? I wasn't even born then, so how, long, how old is that? 65? You guys were alive then. You guys were retired in 65, right? How many years? 55. So in 55 years, we've lost 10,000 priests in the United States. Religious, uh, religious priests, 22,000, 12. We lost 10,000 religious. So that's 20,000 priests less in the United States today than we had 55 years ago. 20,000. That fills up a stadium. 20,000 less priests in the United States. 
priestly vocations, they have about 1,000 a year. Now we have 500, less than 500, half of the of vocations that we used to. And they used to kick people out. They could have had 3,000 every year. They used to kick people out all the time because they didn't have any room for them. All right, religious sisters. We had 180,000 sisters, and now we have 51. The religious sisters and the religious were like downfalls to the church. I mean, good religious orders spark the church. When you don't have religious orders or bad religious orders, it destroys the church. So, so think of that. You had 180,000 religious sisters teaching in schools, you know, being around, being examples. Unless we have less than 50,000 or about 50,000. And the next, you know, one of the other statistics is going to even be more blind, blind boggling. We have 17,000 parishes. We have 17,000 parishes. We have 20,000 less priests, and we have the exact same amount of parishes. Is there a problem there? You know how many parishes we actually need in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati? 25 or 30. Let's be honest. You know, when I was in, when I was talking to priests in California and Texas, they asked about a large-sized church. I said, not really. I have a medium-sized church. I have about 1,000 families or whatever, a little less than 1,000 families probably. And they're like, our smallest church is like 3,000. If we were like those places in California and, and Texas and other places in the diocese, we'd probably have 20 parishes. People could drive a half an hour to church. You know, Father John had parishioners in his place that used to walk five miles, six miles to church. Walk. Took him an hour, hour and a half. We can get a car and drive for a half an hour. I, I said, I said, why don't you? I said, I said to him, I said to someone, I said, you know how long it takes from this parking lot to go down to the mother church? Twelve to thirteen minutes. Why are we here? Why are we here? Why aren't we going down to the mother church? We could all go down to cathedral every Sunday. Fifteen minute drive, not hard, right? And if we could go down there, 25 other parishes could be closed and go down there because they're even closer than we are. You know, I need four parishes in the diocese in the Cincinnati. I mean, let's be honest. But we keep things open. But that's going to change. You know, the beacon light had to job. Then the cathedral? The cathedral fits like 1,500 people. If you had like five priests down there, you could have 10, 12 masses. It'd be awesome. You have a six, you could have 645, you could have a 715, you have a midnight mass that Father could do. It'd be awesome. I right? imagine having 10, 12 masses, having confessions 24 hours a day, exposition 24 hours a day. That would be a rocking place, wouldn't it? And then we grow so big, guess what? They would say, hey, we got to go out all the way out to Coleraine Township because we have too many people. That's what we got to do, you know? All right. Um, Catholic population, 45 million, 55 years ago, 66 million. Yet we have a third of the people that go to mass that we used to. How is that possible? How do we have three times more people going to mass when we have double, almost double the population? Crazy. All right, my religious sisters. Religious sisters. In 1965, we had 180,000 uh, sisters. By 2010, that number is just over 50. In 2009, more Catholic sisters in America were the, over the age of 90 than under 60. Let's say that again. Majority of the sisters, there's more sisters that are 90 and older than 60 and younger. That's crazy. I always tell girls, you want to live forever? Live a long time on earth? Be a nun. If they die at 95, you're like, man, why, why'd she die so young? They live forever. Okay? So that's, that's a statistic that's terrible. As many as 300 of 420 institutions in the last decade have aging membership and declining vocations. So most of the religious institutions now Men and women, 
80% of new vocations go to more traditionally minded orders, orders that have structured community, focus on prayer, liturgical and devotional life, and where habits. Younger women want to give their lives to sacredness, not ideology. So 80% of those young girls who go to religious sisters go to the traditionally minded and not the ones that kind of bought into like the environment and crystals and things like that. So those orders are dying. In the last uh, in the last few years, we've had two women from St. Anne's join religious life. One is still in the religious life. Both went to more traditional order. Supporting seminarians. St. Anne has done an outstanding job supporting seminarians. I thank you. I thank you very much for being so kind, generous, and supportive to the men who were here. It took a little time for people to warm up to them. Because the first year, they did not like my seminarians. What are they doing here? What are they going up to the altar for? I'm like, man, you should be happy. They're here. Yeah. Oh, people complained that I was having them distribute communion, and that was their job, and how dare they. And yeah, it was rough. But they've warmed up since then. All right, you guys warmed up since then. So I've actually, these numbers are wrong because I was going through it with Nick. I've actually had 14 seminarians here, not 12. In eight years, we've had 14 seminarians. There's parishes that haven't had 14 seminarians in a the summer their entire existence. You know, in the la and we are the number one parish in the last eight years of having seminarians. So I don't know why. I don't know if I give them like free food or something and I got to charge them or whatever, but... But I only got two coming back, so I guess I'm, they're bad now to be down there, I guess. So three did their preaching practicums here. Preaching was when they were ordained transitional deacons. They came and they preached. Hopefully, I'll get a fourth one this year. Yes, you had a question? Yeah. In fact, I saw both, most of them yesterday. It was good. Two did their internship. One uh, uh, was here a couple years ago. He's now a priest. He's in his second year, and he's got an assignment for July of five parishes up north. So two years ordained, five parishes up north. But it's up north. They, they take care of themselves up there. And then one of our intern, and then the other intern is not a, is now a transitional deacon as of yesterday. He probably gave his first homily this morning. Ethan, and hopefully he'll come back, and hopefully he'll give all the homilies for the summer and give Father Brady. <laughs> and we have one seminarian who is a member of this parish, Nikolai. You didn't get much right from Paul's, did you? There you go. I should have like 10 seminarians from this parish. But when you have a bad shepherd, you don't get good seminarians. Programs to support seminarians. In the message of His Holiness, Pope Francis, from the 54th World Day of Prayer for Vocations, Pope Francis stated, I wish heartily to encourage this kind of profound friendship with the Lord. Above all, for the sake of employing from on high new vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life. The Seminary Letter Project, I found this. There's a letter seminary, seminary Letter Project, the special initiative founded in 2000 by the New Jersey State Council of the Knights of Columbus. The project provides inspiration to seminarians studying throughout the United States and in Rome by encouraging students in Catholic schools and parish religious education programs, hint, hint, to send letters and cards to men studying for the priesthood, it also promotes vocations to the priesthood and strengthens students' appreciation for the work and study undertaken by those answering the call. This is the We Believe and Share blog to learn more about the Seminary Letter Project. So I think that's a good idea. If anybody wants to, you know, kind of uh, write that down, send letters to, to the men in seminary to encourage them. I don't know if they still do this now, but when I first went in, we actually had an adopt seminary where a family would adopt a, a, sem, a new seminarian. 
you guys want to adopt somebody? You can take Nick, you can take everybody else. <laughs> Nick, our own seminarian. Hey, Nick, why don't you come up and talk a little bit about why you went to seminary, when you entered the seminary, something a little about your life. You can bore them for five minutes or ten minutes, whatever you need. I guess uh, the first place to start uh, for me, um, you know, I can trace my vocation back to like two really important things in my life. Uh, the first being my family, which was, you know, always a extremely supportive environment for me. Um, you know, I've met a lot of seminarians in my day, um, and it's shocking just how many people or how many seminarians have to fight with their family um, to make this call to the priesthood. Um, you know, I was lucky. I came from a really large Catholic family, um, and they were extremely supportive of my, of my vocation, and that was a blessing for me because it allowed me to focus on the true call rather than, you know, trying to fight or, you know, trying to explain myself why I felt called. And the second part that really helped me to accept my vocation was prayer. And unfortunately, for a long time in my life, I wasn't extremely prayerful, you know, even with my family. You know, we uh, we went to daily, we went to Sunday Mass. Um, but other than that, we weren't really engaged in the faith. Um, you know, when I was uh, in second grade, I received the Blessed Sacrament for the first time. And shortly after, I began to start serving at, uh, at my parish. And, you know, for me, you know, my grandfather taught me because he was the... Uh, he was the trainer for servers at the time, and he really gave me a appreciation for just the amount of reverence that is required for the mass. And for me, you know, being up there, you know, being able to see the priest and the sacrifice that was going on and the and the blessed sacrament that he was, you know, bringing forward to the people, you know, it struck me as this, you know, this amazing moment that a lot of people just miss out on. You know, people can go throughout their entire life, you know, just go to Mass, and it's just, you know, this thing that Catholics have to do. But for me at that moment, it was, you know, a moment where I, I saw myself as, as, I think I can do this. You know, this, this could be me in the future. Um, you know, as time went on, I got into my teenage years, and like any teenager, I, I don't like to uh, accept responsibility. So I, I pushed aside uh, all the thought of vocation and such and just, you know, pushed forward on to school. Um, you know, it went, it went like this for a couple of years until I would say I was about uh, my sophomore year. Um, it was at that time that my family really started to get into prayer, you know, daily rosary, you know, all this other stuff, starting to go to adoration and such. And, you know, that was the, uh, the first time that I really started thinking about a vocation seriously again. You know, I had all these different ideas of what I could do. I could be an engineer. You know, I was pretty decent at math at the time. You know, I guess I could be married. That was, you know, obviously the, the most predominant one in my mind at the time as a teenager. Um, and, of course, the priesthood was always in the back of my mind. Um, but I really didn't want to deal with the priesthood at the moment because, you know, I saw that as, you know, I was going to have to give up all this stuff just to be able to do the sacraments here and there. And, you know, in addition, I was going to be this extremely busy person. Um, that just didn't seem appealing to me. Uh, and then over the summer, you know, I was, you know, doing a lot of praying. You know, I was trying to figure out my life and for the future. And I realized that at the time I was trying to take over my life rather than giving it over to God. And at that moment, I realized that if, if my vocation and in my life is going to go the way that it should, I have to give it over to God. I have to give complete control. I have to give my complete will over to God. So over the summer, I, you know, I constantly ask God, like, Lord, you're going to have to take over, take over for me. You're going to have to basically drag me to my vocation if you want me to go there. So over the summer of my junior year, you know, it hit me all of a sudden. It was like this, it was almost as if a weight had been taken off my chest. And at that moment, I felt called to the priesthood. 
So, you know, I quickly called up a couple of priests that I knew, and, you know, they were like, well, I've been waiting for you to be a priest, you know. So it was, a, it was a beautiful moment for me um, just to have all this support from priests, from family and all this. Um, and I eventually, I finally got into seminary. Um, and I can say now that I was definitely underprepared for seminary as a whole. You know, going in, I thought it was just going to be a whole bunch of, you know, prayer and all this. Um, I wasn't ready for the studies and such like that. Um, but that was another moment for me to, you know, relinquish control to God, you know, to give out everything over to God, you know, because you know, I realized that, you know, no matter how smart I'm going to be, I'm not going to be the one bringing people to Christ. It's going to be God himself working through myself. And the more that I give myself over to God, the more that I, that I allow God's will to work in my life, the more that I become closer to Christ and the closer I get to, to heaven. So for me, that's been the, uh, the prevailing thought in my vocation is, you know, giving myself over to God rather than trying to take control myself. Um, and that's my vocation story. So I guess if you, uh, if you have any questions, I'm definitely open. I go to school at the Josephina, but uh, this is my last year. Um, I'll be finishing up this coming Friday, um, and then I'll be moving on to uh, Mount St. Mary's of the West over on the, on the east side. So, very exciting news. Five more years to go. Uh, yes. Oh, um, so I joined the seminary right out of high school. Um, you know, my family, we decided to do, uh, homeschooling. Um, I think it was, uh, I left, uh, Catholic school at about the age, I think 10 years old. So about fourth grade, fifth grade. Um, and from there I was homeschooled all the way until seminary. Yes. Uh, so there's eight of us. I'm the oldest. So it's a medium-sized family, I guess. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, not very often. You know, the, the teachers we have at the seminary are extremely supportive. You know, they're, they're very good Catholic people. And, you know, when someone joins the seminary, you know, there's a lot of people and a lot of money and stuff going into helping these men join the priesthood. Um, now, unfortunately, not everyone's called that joins the seminary. You know, when I joined, my class was, I believe, 23, 24. Um, and this last year, the four of us that are still there that are from the original class are down to four. So we've lost about 20 guys in the course of just three years. Um, now, some of these guys moved on to different seminaries and such, but a lot of them have, you know, realized that, you know, this just isn't their calling. Um, but overall, most people don't end up flunking out. You know, not everyone is, you know, the smartest. Um, but I, I haven't seen anyone in my time ever flunk out of a class, so. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Oh, oh yes. I just treat them like animals. <laughs> I just make sure they don't call me. <laughs> well, they don't call me for dinner. <laughs> well, I guess I hand it back over to Father. Thank you for your time. You know what I'm saying? There's going to be better shepherds in the years to come. Bob McCarthy. Do you have any questions for me? Actually, you know what? I'll go next. You go next. So Doug Moore, you guys know Doug, right? He uh, He's in the diaconate program to be a permanent deacon. Um, and he is now officially the next class to be ordained because we had the guys ordained yesterday. And so he'll be the class of 2022 in April of next year, so less than a year away. So, Doug, why don't you tell us a little about your vocation story, why you en entered the diaconate? Is 
Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, it's funny. I think about this all the time because it's been a uh, it's been quite a journey for me. I uh, have been part of St. Anne's Parish for nearly 50 years. Um, my family started in Mount Healthy, just down the just down the street from Assumption, and uh, we moved over to uh, First Shade Terrace in 68, 69. So we've been a part of the area here. My wife and I, when we got married, we stayed here locally. Um, so it's been a part of our lives, this entire uh, Colerain area and the parish has been part of my life for quite some time. And so I've been very blessed and uh, my mom and dad uh, passed along uh, a while ago and uh, it's hard to believe how long it has been. But I really thank my mom for uh, kind of giving me the nudge to get me going on this uh, extended journey that I've been a part of. It's been, I guess, almost 10 years now since I started taking classes down at the seminary. Uh, so it's been quite a ride. And uh, so my, uh, my CPA uh, occupation sort of kept me on plan B, C, D, or E. I'm not sure what it is. If you, if you, if you know, the, the, the diaconate kind of journey is typically like two years of classwork and you get your lay pastoral ministry certificate. And then you have uh, three years of the actual diaconate program at the seminary and I'm finishing up year two. So uh, a year from yesterday, God willing, I'll be uh, next in line. So I'm really looking forward to that. But, um, but it's been, you know, it's been one of those things where I always hearken back to the story of Samuel and Samuel is hearing God's call and he just doesn't recognize it. He just doesn't, you know, it doesn't put two and two together. He thinks it's Eli, you know, giving him a call. So he's not quite sure exactly what's going on, but he knows somebody's calling him. And then eventually, after a few times, he, he comes around and he, he talks to Eli and Eli kind of gives him the, turns the light on for him and says, hey, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, listen, listen a little closer with a little different perspective and uh, clear out those filters that you've had blocking that, uh, blocking that voice. And so uh, finally he, you know, he hears the Lord and he answers and he says, Lord, here I am. And he doesn't look back. You know, he just takes it and runs with it. And that's uh, when I think about me and I think about, you know, I'm kind of a late bloomer. You know, it took me a little while. I wanted to play basketball when I was young. I played a lot of basketball, but I was too short. And, uh, and I, I should have hung with it, but I, uh, but I always thought I was too short. And unfortunately, uh, I didn't really start to grow until I was uh, probably like a sophomore or junior in high school. And so unfortunately, by then, uh, it was kind of too late. So what did I do? Un incredibly, I became the stats guy. How about imagine that an accountant wanted to be a stats guy for the basketball team. So, uh, so I used my wonderful accounting skills that I learned in my accounting classes at LaSalle and became the stats guy for the basketball team. But anyway, where that's leading is just uh, the fact that it took me a little while to hear, you know, what exactly God was telling me and uh, what He was calling me for. But I was blessed not only with one Eli. Um, I had a lot of Eli's in my life that kind of pulled me along and said, you know, I think it's time for you to turn the corner and make that leap. So I have a lot of Eli's to be thankful for. And uh, one of which is my wife, Lori, uh, who's sitting in the back. So I'm very thankful for Lori because she makes me a better person. And she, uh, she keeps me in line. And um, so I'm very thankful for her. And so between, you know, her, uh, her guidance and uh, her love, uh, we've got Lori, or we've got Becky and Matthew, our, uh, our two children. And so uh, we're, uh, we're building our, our new life together, our uh, second story, so to speak. And so things have been going great. And, um, and watching, uh, watching the diaconate uh, ordination yesterday uh, kind of got my mouth watering, and I'm uh, looking forward, very much forward to next April. But... Uh, so I'm very thankful for all the, 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 the Eli's, the people that uh, kind of helped me through that discernment process. So I can't emphasize enough just the importance of, you know, listening to God's voice in your life and uh, what it is that he's calling you to do. 
and um, what uh, what your next step might be because I've been very blessed and very thankful um, and so it's uh, it's been an interesting interesting 10 or 10 or 11 years now that I've been uh, working through this and very much looking forward to next April and um, being ordained a deacon and um, so that's my story and uh, and if anybody has any questions I'd be happy to take them good no questions <laughs> so. oh, darn it. So the question is, uh, who were some of the other Eli's in my life? And so, you know, it's funny. I, I had been a, a CPA for about 30 years, and um, it was funny. I was working with a client who uh, we were kind of wrapping things up at the end of the busy season before I came to work here at St. Anne's. And the lady said, uh, oh, so, you know, it's funny. You've been doing CPA work for 30 years. And she said, uh, don't you think there's something else that you should be doing with your life? Something like that along that line. And then, uh, and then of course, being uh, blessed to come to work here with Father, um, it all kind of, you know, just kind of fell into place. I was able to come to work here with Father on a part-time basis. I had uh, the blessings of getting to know another CPA out in Blue Ash that was at a different firm who enabled me to work part-time for him and at the same time working part-time here while I was starting my my diaconate uh, classes down at the seminary so it was all just a, a bunch of cards that kind of fell into place for me and just said you know Doug it's time to time to get rolling so you know like I said you know uh, Samuel kind of took the ball and ran with it didn't look back and and I've been very blessed I've been so uh, so incredibly um, you know, blessed with being here at St. Anne's and everything that's been going on. I haven't really looked back at all. I don't look back and say, geez, I wish I was a state of CPA, you know? So, uh, it's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been tremendous. So, yeah. all right. Thank you very much. And I can say that Doug will be an excellent deacon. Um, and then I don't have to preach again next year at all. I can have to preach every week. I can just sit back and relax. Um, I'm not going to bore you guys with my vocation story, per se. No, this is a long journey. Like, I think when I turned 25, I thought, What's this voice telling me I got to do something different? Because I was I was happy. I moved back to Cincinnati. I was in the East Coast for a while working. And uh, job, girlfriend, you know, things were going well. I got promotion every every year. So at 25, I started to hear, like, a voice saying, like, we need, I need shepherds. Like, I need good shepherds. Because there wasn't a lot of good shepherds back back in the 90s, right? Um. And I said, ah, I'm, I'm not smart enough, I'm not talented enough, and I, I want to get married, I want to do something else. So I kind of made a deal, like, at 25, I was like, you know what, I'll go in at 30, thinking my life's going to be different in 25 years, right? And nothing really was different. I mean, I get a, I got a promotion every year, you know, a different girlfriend every year, a couple of them, I guess. I had a, bought a house, and I bought a house, and it turned out to be like a block away, literally a block away maybe even less, to a church. And so, I mean, I could sit on my couch, and when the bell rang, I could go into the church and be sitting before Mass started. That's how close I was, right? But I did have a buddy who was already in seminary in Baltimore. And so as I, you know, as those years were, were clicking, I started asking him some questions. He said, you know what, go to daily Mass and start, you know, go to the Statue of the Blessed Mother and ask, what do, you, what do you want for your, you know, ask your son what you want me to do or something. And so I started going to daily mass when I probably like I was probably like 28 or something. And I did go to a vocation talk at 25 or I made an appointment to go. But I had a there was a party down the street that I decided to go to instead. So I didn't go. To, I didn't even go to that night that I was I said I would go. But then like when I was like 28, I still got a letter from the vocation director. I was like, hmm. And then he sent me another one 
the following year. And then I came up to my 30s and I thought, man, I, the Lord's still asking me to go. So I, was, I remember walking out of a bar. That's how all good vocation stories start. I was in Mount Adams, and right next to one of the bars, the Irish bar is Catholic Church, right? Irish, right? So, so I started thinking to myself, like, what's the point? What's the point of my existence? What's the point of life? You know, am I serving myself? And so eventually I, uh, you know, so I kind of was talking to the vocation director at that point. I did go to a ministry night um, right before my 30th, I think. And then right around that time. And then um, just one day I was like, in the, it was like the beginning of summer. I was like, think about it when I woke up and I was driving to work. And I like looked over and there was a priest driving the car. I was like, what's the priest doing on 75, you know, when he should be saying mass sometime in the morning? So I go to work, and, like, someone put me an article, and on there was a priest. And then someone was talking later in the afternoon about priests, and when I came home, I turned on the TV, and I was watching Law and Order. You guys watch Law and Order? All right? And in an episode, there was a priest. Like, as soon as I turned on the TV, and I thought, man, Lord, you beat me over the head today. So basically... This was midsummer. I mean, they've already, you know, they already did t pretty much did all their acceptance for the year. So I called the vocation director. I had a meeting with the diet with the with the seminary. I broke I quit my job and broke up with my girlfriend and put my house on the market all in the same week. And went in like two weeks, like three weeks later. And I didn't even tell my parents. So I flew down to tell my parents, and I and I, I lied to them. Lying's a sin, isn't it? I said I, I said I was coming down there for business, and I'd stop over and see him. So we were sitting at the table, and I said, I have something to tell you. Um, I'm thinking about being a priest, so I'm going to the seminary in a, in a couple weeks. And the first response was to my dad, what about grandkids? That was the response. And my parents were very faithful people. My dad was super traditional. I think I was traditional, but that's much, much more, right? Um, and I was just like, wow, that's the response. Um, now, they tell me years later, because I bring it up, they were like, we were just in so shock. We had no idea what to say. Like, they didn't really say anything. They were shocked when I left. They had no idea. And uh, they, they didn't think, they were worried that, you know, it might not work out. Um, they probably realized I probably wasn't smart enough to, get, to go through seminary, <laughs> like you said about failing classes. I said, Lord, I'm not good at school. I partied my whole time in college, pretty much. I said, if you want me in, you have to get me through the classes. And he did. I got better. I, my grade got better every year. I have no idea why. All right? And I also wanted money. One of my big things was I want to be rich. I want to retire like 50. Right? I'm not retired, am I? And so I, I said, Lord, you know, I want to have enough money. So one of the things is I wanted to stockpile enough money in the bank. So I was set. And this is how the Lord works. So I got, I got a new position that I was getting like 50% of my pay on a bonus. Right? If I did well, I'd done well, really well that year. Right? Well, I ended up leaving before the end of the year, so they took away my bonus. So that's 50000 out the door. Then my house took 14 months to sell, so I used all my savings to pay for my mortgage while I was in seminary for the first year. The first year after I was in seminary, I had $50 in the bank. And the Lord just said, you got to get rid of the things. Don't worry about it. I'll provide. He provided my education. He provided, you know, my, my living, you know, what I needed to survive. So, you know, it's scary because sometimes you put yourself out there in the deep as the Lord calls the, the apostles, and you think, I'm never going to survive. You know, but the Lord provides. Right? And that, that's the trusting. And the funny thing is, is, like I said, I was a big partier in college, unfortunately. Um, but so I had to send letters to, to people to give me character witnesses. And I wasn't going to tell my family. So I was like, who am I going to send my letters to, right? Um, so I sent them to my college buddies, and every one of my college buddies, I thought was just going to like, what the hell are you doing? You know, this and that. Um, but every one of them came back and said, yeah, we saw you. I was like, even in college? Like, yeah, we can see that. So that was an affirmation, you know, when I went in. 
but ultimately all vocations start at home. You know, um, the good models that parents give. But I, I say that example of my parents because, you know, parents are selfish. Right? They are. They, they want grandkids. They have to accept kids. You know, you get kids because you want kids, grandkids eventually, right? Um, but they, they don't, they, they want life to work out. And even the most faithful people think, you know, being a life of a priest is difficult because it's hard. We're working all the time, which is a bad example, really, to be exposed to vocations because we shouldn't be busy all the time. Um, but parents tend to be selfish because they, they think they know what's best for their kids. And they don't, they lack the trust, like these are God's kids first. Um, and I say that to, I want to say that to parents and grandparents, because I want you to encourage your kids in that and trust that if this is what God's calling them to, they'll be happy. They'll be happier than what, what their own decisions would be. Now, my parents were thrilled, you know, when I became a deacon, when I went to be a priest, they're so proud of me now. When they come in here, my mom got treated like royalty, you know. Yeah. Once they're in, and once they get ordained, the story changes. They couldn't see my life without being a priest. But the initial thing is a shocker to parents, right? Because it's not something that's common, right? I mean, talked about family struggles. We we had a, we had some guys. A guy went in, um, and his mom wasn't Catholic. In fact, she was against Catholicism. And they converted, and like after he converted, like a year later, he went to the seminary. His mom disowned him. And a couple years later, his brother <laughs> got converted and went to the, to the seminary, and she disowned him too. Both of them were, uh, one of them was ordained a priest um, in March, and the other one's going to be ordained a priest in May. You know, I don't know. I think the mom kind of accepted him because they had another brother, and I think she was afraid that the third brother would become a priest too. <laughs> but, so, as, as we, we profess our faith, you're here, you go to church, but sometimes we can be a little selfish because we think that maybe this is not the right life. And maybe, and again, maybe that's the bad example that the priest set that it, sometimes our busyness keeps us from seeing that this is a vocation. But, you know, the Lord tells us to lay down our lives, right? So that's why I say this to you because I want you to encourage vocations and not discourage vocations. All right, everybody wants a priest, but not everybody wants a priest from their families. All right. And plus, parents don't ever think that their priests, that their kid, their sons are going to be good priests. Like, I'll give you an example. I'll give you two quick examples because I don't see what I don't see them there here. But like, I have a buddy, and I know his parents. You guys will too, but I'm not going to say it. And she's always like, "Man, can you help him with homilies? Can you help him do this?" Like, it's like, oh, he needs help because he needs to, you know, he needs to be a better priest. And I'll talk to my mom. I'm like, yeah. And she'll ask me a, a thing. And I'll say, yeah, this is a teach church teaching. And she'll say, can you ask Father Beetle? <laughs> so a, a prophet is never appreciated in his own house, right? Because <laughs> everybody thinks their kid is worthless. But the, but the buddy that he goes to school with, oh, he's genius, right? <laughs> That's just how it is, right? So, I mean, short and quick, that was kind of my, my story. Um, so we'll see what the Lord has for me in store in the future. You had a question? Well, the guy was the guy wasn't Catholic, but he was kind of I can't remember what religion he was. But he was kind of pro Christianity, so I think he was pretty excited. The rest of them, I think, were kind of shocked, even though they were, they were the Catholics. See, the funny thing is, when I first my first couple of years in seminary, I got the most discouragement from Catholics. And the most encouragement from non-Catholics. You know, it's funny, like, hey, you pray for things. Like, I've, I've been to, like, 20 weddings. I've been at 15 weddings and stuff. And I'd always be sitting next to the guys, whatever. And I was like, man, where's all the girls I can hang out with? My first year at seminary, my buddy, one of my younger buddies got married. And I got a table with seven women. <laughs> who were all gorgeous. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm married in the seminary. What am I doing? And every old lady that I would talk to, like, why are you wasting your life in the seminary, this and that? And all the girls were like, man, that's the awesomest thing. And I thought, these Catholic old women are discouraging a vocation, and all these beautiful girls who are not even Catholic are encouraging. So sometimes we have to watch, you know, how we, how we encourage our young men, 
you know, younger age to talk about vocations. You just get it done. Someone who is a night owl has to start learning to be a morning person, unfortunately. You just got to get done. Prayer is the for source. If I don't have my prayer, then I just become an employee. Well, you got to, I mean, to have a disciplined life, you have to have a set of time. So, this is what it is. All right, did I bore you guys enough? Anything you want to know about the priesthood? It's awesome, by the way. Oh, sorry. You got to deal with it, except for you got to deal with people. Tell me now. Yes. It is, but you know the, the, the numbers are declining in the future. So they built the place. Um, we have other other dioceses come to us. So we have like maybe like 90 guys at the major seminary right now, and maybe only like 50 of them are Cincinnati. So, yes. No, I'm too dumb. No, literally, I'm too dumb. You have to get a doctorate. The shortest doctorate, I think, is three to four years. One guy's going there for like seven or eight years. That's after he went to the major seminary. So he had five, he's already done four years. He got five more years left. And if he got a, a major doctorate, it'd take him another seven years. That's a lot of schooling. So you have to have a doctorate to teach at the seminary now. And they know I'm not smart enough to get a doctorate. I mean, you gotta, you gotta like have enough Latin and enough Greek in order to read all the old manuscripts. You know, you got to be able to speak Italian if you go to Rome. I can barely speak English. I'm not seriously. My buddies who are teaching a seminary, some of them know five, six languages. They can speak, you know, English and then rattle off Italian, like, conversationally. Those guys have skills. You know, Father John knew, like, 12 languages. He's doing all right. I heard it from him at Easter time. He's doing pretty good. Supporting priests. It's tough out there, and we as priests don't help. Seriously. The last 20 years have been super awesome scandals in America and our diocese, and there seems to be a thought, when will the next one come? This makes it tough for Catholics to be rah-rah. When it, I don't know if I spelled that right. Rah-rah when it comes to priests. My first three years weren't all rainbows and lollipops, that's for sure. The point is, people have lost trust in priests, ability to be good shepherds. At least, at least, it may, uh, at least that's not ultimately. At least, uh, I thought you spell check this thing or wrote the grammar. Uh, ability to be good shepherds, at least immediately. That's what it's supposed to be immediately. Priests have to earn trust much more than in the past. Like for example, when I came here, everything I did was to correct things that were wrong. And everybody thought, who is this guy changing things? Not everybody. But what I'm saying is, I came in and I told them, I'm here not to change things, I'm here to correct things. You think they were supportive? No, not at all. Well, we don't trust you. Like, And that's and that's one of the problems of the past. You, there, sh there used to be an automatic trust to, in priests. At least when it comes to the sacramental life and trying to get people to heaven. But you don't have that. And that's tough. Coming into a new place, people don't trust the priests anymore automatically. It should be from one shepherd to another shepherd. 
we should be faceless. Right? So people don't support the priests as they did in the past, or at least immediately. It takes time. And that's true in all relationships, but they used to be an ultimate that I could trust. I mean, you guys remember um, Obi-Wan Kenobi? Yeah. Right? He was, he was, a, he was I think he was a Protestant. And uh, what? And um, and so, what's his name? No, no, not Obi Wan. Who who was his real name? Oh, I'm trying, Alex Guinness, right? And he, he was an actor, and he and he played one time. He 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 played a priest. And when he left the set, he had something to go, so he didn't change. And he walked down, I think it was in France or something. He walked down the street, and this little kid would, like, follow him and, like, talk to him. He's like, you know, where's your parents? He's like, oh, you, you, where's your... And so the kid followed him. And um, after that, he reflected. He said, this little kid trusted me absolutely because I look like a priest. And that led to his conversion to become Catholic. Would that happen today? You know, one of the things like, and these things maybe were like, were, were, were things in my life that helped me to discern the priesthood. But I remember one time I was like 15 or six, not probably 16 because I drove to church. I was like 16, I think. My buddy was 16 and my other buddy was 17. And it was the summer and we didn't have work that day or something. And so we drove to the, the parochial vicar's house like early in the morning for something. He's like, hey, you guys want to go to the beach? So we jumped in his car. He had GTO convertible. He jumped in his car. We drove to the beach, which is like an hour, two hours away. We hung out all day, came back late at night, went home. Now imagine a priest taking three kids that are two 16-year-olds and a 17-year-old by himself. That's a violation of child protection. But the other guy in the car was has been a priest for 18 years now. See what I'm saying? Those things are hampering our vocations. All right? Uh, priests are men. We are not perfect, but neither are you. And that's the one thing that ticks me off about people talking about the scandals and this and that. They're expecting the priests to be perfect. We're not. We're human flesh like everybody else. We sin. We have to go to confession just like everybody else. There's a reason my confession line is busy. But priests love their people and support their people. Many long hours and many sacrifices. Why does the people give us a save? If, you, if I hear your confessions, then you know I sin too. So why is my, my, my action scandalous and yours not? Right? We're trying to all be in the same thing. We're trying to love God, and we make mistakes. Right? But the priests are highlighted. They expect more. And that's funny. Since society doesn't believe in God or Jesus Christ as the salvation, then why are they holding priests to a higher standard than the rest of the world? Because deep down they know that priest represents God. They, they, deep down they know, or else they wouldn't be scandalizing the priests less to destroy that. All right? But, surprise, but, but surprisingly, most priests, including me, think for the most part our people and Catholics in general are very supportive, especially given our past. People are supportive, even though we don't give you guys good reason to be supportive, right? And I'm thank you for that, and all priests thank you for that, right? Because, yeah, we don't make it tough. We, we give bad example, right? Always on the news, there's something. You know, I could be the next guy. You never know, so pray for me, right? So thank you very much for your support. There is only one good shepherd I wonder if I am more a hired hand than a good shepherd. People expect a lot and for good reason. Just remember there is only one good shepherd. In the end, that is what ultimately matters. The value of a priest as it relates to his shepherding is if he is following and teaching what the good shepherd teaches or, his, or, or determining whether he's preaching Christ or he's preaching his own version of Christ. This includes the sacraments. Our job is to do what the church tells us. If I don't do what the church is asking me to do, I'm not being a good shepherd either. All right? We might not like some of the rules. We might not like some of the rubrics, whatever it is. But that's what we're given to.
and we follow them. The apostles were not perfect, and neither are our priests today. But that doesn't mean we are not appointed by Christ, given his power and authority to lead the flock. And that must always be kept in mind, whether or not the faithful like their priests' personalities. You know, one, one passage I always reflected on was the time of King David, right? When he had a chance to kill Saul. And he said, I cannot kill God's anointed. So yeah, you have bad priests out there, but they're still God's anointed. God will take care of it. But we don't touch God's anointed. All right? Pray, pray, pray for your priests. As St. John Vianney said, there are no bad priests. Only priests whose people haven't prayed hard enough yet for him. <laughs> Although that, not be, that might not be 100% true, you get the point. So pray, pray, and pray for your priests, for all priests, for seminarians, and the young men in the future to be priests. All right? So we got seven men being ordained priests in May. We had three that are transitional deacons, meaning that next year they will also go through to be priests. Now that's the difference between transitional deacons and permanent deacons. He'll always be a deacon. At least he die. But we're priests forever. In the word of Melchizedek. All right. So anybody have any questions before I end with the prayer? Yes. Coincide with the ordination yesterday? Like, no, it's always on Good Shepherd Sunday, from what I hear. It, it wasn't for the past 15 years. I don't know. Like I said, I didn't know. I thought this was the first year. <laughs> Obviously, I don't know anything. Yeah, breathe, yeah. But the, the Holy Father did ordain nine men to priesthood in, in Rome yesterday. This morning. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the solution to a lot of the. It is. The, 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 nuns, the nuns are the backbone of the church. Really, they are. I mean, everybody respects nuns. I think nuns are holy. Right? You know, we have a different job than nuns do. We bring Christ, they, they give good example. Right? That's that's the trade off, right? But when you don't have good nuns walking around and teaching in schools, you can't expect for the church to be strong. You know? Right part of my mind is um, when they start talking to someone. When they walk away, you just you're just stunned. Yep. Yeah, everybody respect everybody respects nuns. No one will no one will say a bad thing about nuns. All right, like good sisters, no one's gonna say anything. You know, and, and even like I was in a bad neighborhood in Baltimore, like right after I got ordained, and I was wearing my collar. That was about the safest thing I could do. They you know they respected the priest back then. Now everybody else would have got shot to death, but I got lucky. All right, but people respect in the hardcore the nuns. They're outstanding. And if we don't have a strong nuns, but women let you enter vocations less than the men do. You know. And there's a great religious sister in, in Covington. They're excellent. Those the Franciscan sisters of the Eucharist or Mary or whatever, they're excellent too. And they are in a bad neighborhood, and they deal with it all the time. People pull guns on everybody else but them. In fact, in fact, they said sometimes uh, um, if someone's like an outsider that comes in the neighborhood, they'll have to stop because sometimes they'll they'll take a a, a, a pipe or something and they'll start beating people if they're messing with the sisters. I mean, that neighborhood protects their nuns. You know, it's a rough neighborhood, but 
you don't mess with the nuns down there, or else the locals will get you. <laughs> which is which is great. All right. So I, I appreciate it. We're going to end with the prayer of voca vocations of the world prayer. All right. But I do appreciate your support to the parish and to vocations to the Yakin, uh, supporting him. Like I said, he'll be a great deacon, but he has, still has another year. He has another five years. Um, Ethan has another year. So and I only have a few more years. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty Father, we wish all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of your truth. Send, we thank you, laborers into your harvest, and grant them grace to speak your word with all boldness. On this world day of prayer for vocations, increase those who respond to the priesthood and religious life for many years to come. In a special way, pray for young men to respond to the call to be priests, especially from our families in this parish. Help those in seminary to persevere and grant them a secure path. Bless the men being ordained as priests this year throughout the church and the seven men in our diocese. Bless those who were yesterday to the diaconate to help them in their final year of formation. Pray for all your seminarians, especially our own, as he enters major seminary this fall. Finally, we pray for our priests, good and bad, young and old. Give them the strength and courage to be bold in proclaiming the faith. Protect them from the evil one and their demons. And grant them a humble and contrite heart, so as to do your work and carry out your will. Watch over our pastor, make him a better priest and servant. And when the time comes, give us a better pastor to lead and guide us to the future. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I love when you guys chuckle when I tell you you guys got to pray for a better pastor. But you should. You should be praying that every pastor who follows is better. Because that's the only for you guys. Right? So that's what you should pray for. Right? God bless you. Thank you.